physiologists, healthcare professionals, and the general public in terms of health and wellness. His professional expertise and personal commitments and passion for physical activity, nutrition, health, and wellness in its fullest sense, and the whole person in terms of body, mind, and spirit are really inspiring to all. In the interest of time, I'm not going to be spending a lot, and I won't be spending a lot of time here in terms of the highlights, uh, but I want to pick out a few things of Vic's distinguished career. He came to the University of Michigan, the Department of Physical Education, or I should say the Department of Physical Education in 1972, that was 43 years ago, as an assistant professor. And a year later, he became the first head basketball coach of Michigan's women's basketball team. Yay! <laughs> now, Vic would have continued to be both the academic and the coach, but I guess it was Paul Hunsinger who brought him into his office, closed the door, and says, you need to make a decision. Are you going to be an academic, or are you going to be a coach? And Wolverine basketball did not have the honor and the privilege of having Vic as the continuing coach. And we, however, have had the, the distinguished Dr. Cash here, basically, to provide all this guidance and really education to all of our students and faculty and staff. After becoming a full professor, Vic established the Advanced Fitness Training Center using a grant to test a new type of strength and equipment, exercise equipment, and he added the groundbreaking weight control clinic a few years later. His research and innovation in energy metabolism, nutrition, weight control, and human performance have received dozens of competitive grants, totaling millions of dollars. And through his company, Fitness Technologies Incorporated, Vic has consulted on health and wellness issues for organizations such as the Dallas Cowboys, Mattel, and the U.S. Olympic Committee. Throughout his career, Vic has been a prolific writer, reviewer, editor, lending his experience to numerous scientific journals such as the Pediatric Exercise Science, Annals of Human Biology, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and mainstream publications such as Shape, Self, Vogue, and our own Michigan Today, where he has a column, monthly column, Health Yourself, which I read consistently and it's actually outstanding in terms of information that I get from this. I shouldn't say actually, it's true. <laughs> I shouldn't be surprised. surprised. <laughs> but basically, it's got a, and it's, the other thing I will point out, and I think, and I don't really, I couldn't find out the statistic, but the textbook of Ricardo Catch and Catch, of Physiology, Energy, Nutrition, and Human Performance, now in its eighth edition, or is there another one? Ninth edition, can't keep up, is really the gold standard in terms of exercise physiology. So Vic ranks along with all the elite in the field, his awards and honors are given by his peers. I'll just name a few. He's elected to the fellow of the Research Consortium of the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Kinesiology and the American College of Sports Medicine. He was a recipient of the Outstanding Teaching Award from the school, and he was a Distinguished Professor Award nominee at the university. Uh, about th I just want to give a short story. Uh, about three years ago, I think it was, that Vic gave a presentation down at Florida Seminars. This is where the alumni and so forth down to Florida in February, which is a good time to go to Florida, um, basically are given presentations from faculty. And Vic was one of those who was chosen. That he basically, it was a standing room only. And you might be, the, the theme was, so you want to live to be 100. And it was amazing, and there was over 150 people in the room packed, I was standing in the back, and it was interesting, the, the amount of buzz, as I would call it, the, the questions that came up, the questions afterwards, Vic was one of the most popular people at that whole conference in terms of, can you tell me more about this, can you tell me more about this? He did an outstanding job, really bringing together a lot of the work of, of how do you eat better, how do you exercise, mindfulness, and ultimately how do you have a, a quality of life that you really want to have. Finally, I'm pleased to announce the, uh, the launch of the Victor L. Catch Award for Excellence. It's a gen one of the generous alumni of the school has given a lead gift, and the school will be, be providing matching funds up to $20,000, dollar for dollar, for anyone who would be providing funds for that. Yes, we'll pass well, it So there will be more details as we come up, as it's really in the very formative stages right now, but I wanted to give you that bit of a, an announcement. 
Um, and Vic basically wanted to know that we hope your contributions and the impact that will continue for many years. Uh, and for all that you've done, um, we really are very, very pleased uh, that you've been at Michigan, that you've contributed to Michigan, and that you made an impact. You've made the Michigan difference in terms of being here. And now, actually, unfortunately, Dee Eddington, who was the director of kinesiology um, for 1976 to 1998, was unable to be here, but he gave me a few remarks that I would like to read, and I promised Dee that I would do this, and I'll just read it. So Vic, I regret being in Providence today rather than at Ann Arbor. However, I want to express my respect and personal gratitude for your 40 plus years of service of physical education, movement science, kinesiology, and the University of Michigan. And Dee wanted to make, he said, I can, I can make hundreds of points, but I'll just make three because I know the interest of time. Um, he said, you are one of the original, perhaps one of the last of the true spirits of physical education having studied with Franklin Henry at the University of California, Berkeley, and then passing your passion to hundreds of students at Michigan and throughout the country. I know many gathered in California recently to pay their respects for your creative gifts to them and the field. Secondly, he said, you preceded me to Michigan, and then we grew together in physical education in athletics with Don Canham when he was athletic director in the School of Education with Dean Wilbur Cohen and survived nine provosts and six presidents. Yeah. <laughs> Probably more than that, but Dee said I stopped counting about 17 years ago. Uh, we made it out of the School of Education in 1984, and you along with other faculty and the Office of Student Affairs kept growing and formed the bedrock for kinesiology as a school it is known today. And number three, he said your research record is one of the best in the country. During your time, your teaching, your textbooks still guide students into their careers, your professional service has been a model for all of us, including your growing and leading role in physical activity, nutrition, and overall wellness. Actually, he added a fourth one. He said, my last point is that I'm really sorry I missed your coaching career at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so, he says, it's my pleasure to share my academic experiences with you during my 37 years at Michigan. I wish you and Heather continued great experiences at Ann Arbor. And now, unfortunately, on the program, we were supposed I won't say that. Nope. So, fortunately, uh, we have a quick recovery. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. So, this is Jim Richardson, the former head coach of the University of Michigan's women's swim team. Jim, if you could come forward. the uh, email from Ann, I, I didn't even wrestle with the thought of being here. Uh, my relationship with Vic, I can't even remember when we met the first time, but I do know that the work that you were doing with the students at South Quad with the higher fitness equipment, um, we ended up working with Vic uh, with our summer campers. And so our summer campers who came to Michigan, stayed in South Quad, all had the opportunity to get exposed to Vic his students and his philosophy about strength training and, and conditioning and athletic performance. And that certainly bled over into what I was doing and what I was working uh, to try to create with our women's swimming team at Michigan. Um, it is an honor to be here. I, I got the invitation and I thought this would be great and somewhat informal. And then I took a look at everybody on the list and it kind of reminded me of an old Tonight Show the Rat Pack came out with Frank Sinatra and um, Peter Lawford and all that group. And then they finally brought out George Goebel. And George sat down in the chair and looked around, paused, and said, Did you ever feel that the whole world was a tuxedo and you were a pair of brown shoes? <laughs> and that's what I have on today, the brown shoes. But it is a, a real honor to be here uh, to just share a few words about what Vic has meant to me personally, and certainly what he meant indirectly to our program. Uh, there's no doubt, I mean, you'll hear about his intellect, uh, his accumulation of knowledge, his ability to teach, all those kinds of things. And certainly he is superlative in that regard. But I want to share a story with you that was very meaningful to me personally. Um, a young man on our men's swim team approached me a few years back, and he was struggling here in Michigan. He was having a really difficult time personally 
He was having a difficult time on the swim team, and he was having a difficult time academically. And oftentimes with 18, 19 year olds, what we would like to see is when they first realize they have problems, they're going to come forward and ask for help. Unfortunately, in my experience, that's the exception. Most of them tend to withdraw, and they disappear, partly out of discomfort, partly out of shame, etc., who knows for sure. But that's what this young man did. And he approached me near the end of the semester, and he had finally made the decision to leave Michigan, the transfer. But his transfer was going to be problematic because it involved being able to be accepted at the next university, and he had made a disaster of his academic performance that semester. One of his professors was Dr. Catch. And I know that Dr. Catch was really concerned about the young man because he called me, because he had a decision to make. Was he going to do what you should do from a standpoint of performance of the kid versus the performance of everybody else? Or was he going to look deeper? And so he asked me questions about this young man's character. And I could vouch for the young man's character. He's from Western Michigan. Came from a great family. Came from a great... He was a great young man with great character. He just got on the wrong track for a semester and made some bad decisions. And had to pay for them by leaving the university. And as I said earlier, the ability to leave here and go somewhere else and be accepted into school, get in, and then resume his athletic career, hinged on at least one person that I know of, Dr. Catch. And in him asking me about his character, I realized that this is a man, and I knew it before already, but this is a man, despite all the intellect, etc., this is a man with great empathy, this great compassion, which is one of the great things I find in teachers. I was a high school teacher in eight and a half years in the inner city seen a lot, a lot. And one of the things I look for now in people, teachers, administrators, etc., is empathy and compassion. And in my mind, Vic did the right thing from an empathetic, compassionate viewpoint. He allowed that young man to go to the next university where he ended up graduating and was an All-American and is having a wonderful life right now. And I think that speaks to the heart of the kind of person Vic Ketch is. Above and beyond all the intellect, all of the knowledge, all of the accomplishments that he's done. Uh, and I think that at a place like this, where sometimes we're probably known more for our hubris <laughs> than we are for our compassion, and than we are for our empathy, it's such a breath of fresh air to have been able to work with Vic and Vic, I look forward to our continued coffees. We haven't had one this year, so we need to have one because I continue to rely on him. We're doing a lot of motor learning work right now with young people, and he's one of my absolute go-to people. So Vic, thank you. And as I said, I look forward to a future with you still. The only thing is I wish you'd come out with that How to Live to Be a Hundred about 30 years ago. <laughs> Some of those things I could have done something about. Maybe. So it gives me great pleasure right now, I would like to welcome to the stage professional faculty at Washington Community College and former student of Vicks, Marvin Balut.
When I left the department in 2007 and was trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my career, he set up a meeting with the Vice President of Instruction at Washtenaw Community College. And that eventually led to the best job I've ever had and the best fit in terms of employment that anyone can imagine. So I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, but maybe even more grateful for something else. It'll take me a few minutes to get into this, so I'm sorry, please bear with me. Somewhere in the dusty attic of my memories from my early religious education resides an image of Paul at the feet of Gamaliel. Now that will be unfamiliar to most of you, but Paul is the apostle from the New Testament. Gamaliel is a revered uh, scholar, rabbi. Uh, biblical history holds that Paul authenticated his Jewish street cred by claiming to have studied at the feet of Gamaliel. So that tells you who Gamaliel is. Uh, so I suppose my catechism instructors use that phrase uh, to sort of evoke uh, uh, the reverence that one should have for one's instructor and the attention one should pay. Um, in my mind, it conjured an indelible image of a student sitting cross-legged on the floor looking up in rapt attention at the master teacher. I can only guess that that attitude describes how Vic felt toward his mentor, Franklin uh, Henry. But Henry's name certainly came up very often in our discussions, and usually with a distinctive reverence. Yeah? yeah. Uh, I can assure you that that image describes me at the feet of the cash in 615. 615 was a required course for doctoral students. Uh, it dealt with the philosophy of science. I don't doubt that many of the students found it dry and theoretical, especially compared with the stuff they were interested in, physiology, uh, motor learning, biomechanics. Uh, but for me, I devoured it like uh, a man emerging from a famine. Uh, I ate that stuff up. I loved it. The ideas that we wrestled with in that class became embedded and became part of my being. They are a critical part of who I am and what I do today. As a teacher, the most important task that I have is to teach students to discern truth. If they can learn how to do that, they don't need me anymore. It's my raison d'etre, or my reason for being. I am, of course, indebted to all my teachers and mentors and, and all the ways that in which I experience the process of science teaching me bits and pieces and small lessons and sometimes more profound ones about how to approach problems, how to think, and how to separate the wheat from the chaff. But 615 is where it all came together for me. Um, 615 pulled all the remnants of science together and knit them into a coherent uh, philosophical fabric. Today, I share with my students the many lessons that I learned in my scientific journey. And if this set of teachings that I share with my students has a unifying principle, it's the syllabus for 615. Uh, Vic was kind enough to put some of what we discussed in writing. He published an article in Medsci Sports and Exercise entitled, The Burden of Disproof. It's an admonition to fellow scientists to keep in mind that the best experiments are designed to disprove rather than support hypotheses. To this very day, my students and I read and discuss this article each semester. And Vic, you should be gratified to know that it works not just with scientists, but with students from all portions of the academic spectrum. They get it. Uh, and they experience personal growth because they have struggled with those concepts. I have many fond memories of Vic, finding old historical dynamometers, plaster casts of body parts, barometers, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> slings like and other anachronisms in 
the CCRB uh, storage room. Uh, the great conversations that we had about, about science. The memorable lectures delivered with blazing passion. I'd like to think that if Franklin Henry were here today, he would be proud and pleased to know that so many of his lessons are being passed from generation to generation. It is said that the highest form of, uh, that imitation is the highest form of flattery. So I'll end by emulating my revered teacher in the manner in which he closed each session of 615. Questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> criticisms? Arguments? Salutations? Donations? <laughs> Donations, especially. <laughs> Money. Thank you. to introduce the retired director of recreational sports, who's known Vic for 43 years, and is his current golf partner, Bill Cannon. I'm going to say <laughs>
Michigan. Mike Hankowitz was a tight end and linebacker. He's presently the defensive coordinator for Northwestern. Dick Pitcher and Dick Lapman were two other players. They're both national paddleball champions. Art Weltman, who should have been here today. He was a new grad student. He was on the team. Vic and me, we didn't get much playing time. <laughs> I think I was the long snapper on pumps. Well, we breezed through all the faculty staff and we actually made it to the uh, all-campus champion that year, championship that year. Well, it was 43 years that that was our beginning. And I have to get this quote right. So I have written this down. The age that we are, I cannot remember everything anymore. And I can't tell you all the things I remember about Vic. <laughs> Think about that. I can't tell you all the things I do remember about Vic. As Ron mentioned, uh, Vic was the women's first varsity uh, basketball coach back in 73-74. I know his record. He, and this is probably why he went on into physical education. <laughs> He was 3-8, and 0-1 oh in conference play. Now you have to think about that time, beginning of women's intercollegiate sports. Everybody had to drive their personal cars. They probably weren't allowed to play out of state at that time. So the only game we lost in conference was against MSU. I also looked up, and please, if you have the chance to look up his picture on the U of M website, um, Vic doesn't have bad hair days these days. Uh, I used to have what I called an anglo that was black and curly and went out like this. In the vernacular of that day, the only thing I can say about Vic's dark hair was it was really kinky. <laughs> For those of you that know, don't know, his college baseball coach was Dick Ember. National announcement. 43 years in one place. I came here in 67, left in 73, came back in 76, left in 85, came back in 2000, and all the time Vic's been here and we've been following each other's careers. Everybody else on the program today is an academic, so I know there's a lot of academics out there, so please don't take real offense to what I'm about to say, but I'm a retired staff member, so I can say these things. Vic is a staff member's academic, a true staff member's academic. When he looks for a decision, he looks at a problem, he goes for it, and he makes his decision. He hasn't checked the recent literature. He hasn't set up a committee to make it a research project. He makes a decision. Staff members really like that event. <laughs> Over the years, we've shared a lot. Our wives, Heather and Judy, along with Heidi Braun back there, were in a Shakespeare uh, club together, Shakespeare reading club together. Uh, we traveled to Stratford at least once, maybe a couple of times, as extended family of the Mackenzies, uh, along with uh, Heather and her family and, uh, and the Brauns. A lot of fun. When we hosted the Big Ten, uh, meetings in 2013 in the Department of Recreational Sports. It was our 100th anniversary of recreational sports. And I couldn't think of a better person to be that keynote speaker than Vic. He was our keynote speaker and he didn't do Live to 100. And I'm sure all of you have seen Vic lecture, but I'm going to try to emulate this. This is Vic. He's out here, he's making a <laughs> but, and he's back over this way, and then he's back over this way. He never slows down, he's never behind the podium. He's going all the time. And his theme that day, which is one of my favorite things I love about this guy, his theme that day was go asthma. Get off your ass and start moving around, <laughs> was the title of his lecture that day. As uh, 
Jim, excuse me, as Marvin mentioned, Vic and I are golf partners. We have been partners for the last five years in the Thursday night men's, uh, excuse me, Thursday night faculty staff league. Cheryl's in that league, so it's not the men's league anymore. <laughs> now, Vic. Vic is right-handed. He plays golf left-handed. But he still putts right-handed. With his hands crossed like a left-hand. I just can't get that through my brain. How anybody can play golf that way. There's a lot going on. He also has gadgets. Now, he and I have played golf together at the Blue Course probably a hundred times, at least. We get to a place, and Vic goes, oh, wait a minute, let me tell you, let me tell you the distance. He said, Vic, I think I got it, it's about 90. He goes, no, wait a minute. He looks on his gadget and on his watch. No, I'm not sure about that. Pulls out one that's in the palm of his hand. <laughs> Yeah, that's still not big, right? Now he gets the bionic scope. <laughs> and he puts that up and he goes, yeah, it's not 90, it's 92. <laughs> but the best thing when Vic and I play golf is we talk. We talk about life. We talk about our kids. We talk about our wives. We talk about deans, right? <laughs> we talk about vice presidents. We talk about ADs. We talk about California, we talk about consulting, we talk about growing vegetables, cooking, being entrepreneurs, the inventions that we've made, the consulting that we've done. Notice, you don't talk much about golf, there's not much to talk about. <laughs> Vic is also quite competitive. I cannot tell you how many times around it's a, oh, Victor, oh, Victor, out of his mouth. Uh, one thing that we started a while ago, we have that back here. And this is a little trophy that we actually started back in 2008, and it's Vic and Cheryl Zadie play on a team, and my wife Judy and I play on a team. And we started playing 18 holes, 6 holes, every one of the formats of the Ryder Cup, just to make things interesting. A lot of fun, you know, best ball, uh, alternate shots, head to head. Well, so we still have been doing this since 2008. Uh, the last time we played was this past May, and Vic and Cheryl retained the cup. Um, but this is not the Ryder Cup, this is the Ryder Truck Cup. This is actually from Ryder Truck, we went online and got it. And so this is our trophy. Uh, it costs $4.50 and $7 to ship it. <laughs> and so this is what I have for Vic and Cheryl today, because I just took it home, and I'm the one that etches the names on it, so the names are actually, it's engraved here. Not very good, but it's engraved. And I, uh, I, I do it with a, a, a dreidel. No, it's not a dreidel. That's that hobbit on it. Uh, it's a drum. I do it with a drum. And so, I have this to present today, but I'll tell you, Vic, it's been a great 43 years. We're going to keep playing golf. One of my best friends, colleague, and a great partner. Thank you very much. Now I can introduce um, Charlie Marks. Of him, or they didn't like him so much. I mean, some people are saying, Oh, yeah, I could just tell. 
Um, but oftentimes, and more often than not, I had a comment like, he really changed my life. He really had a profound impact on his students in one way or the other, positive, whether it was about learning, teaching them about how to live a healthy lifestyle, about how to make them work harder, about how to be a better student. I know I lost my place. Um, and I think of why, why he was so successful in that way was because he really loved his job. He really loved what he did. And maybe that's why I didn't really know what he did for so long. I think that work was woven into his life, and then therefore it was woven into our lives. And so it wasn't a big issue. There wasn't a lot of complaining about going to work. It was a part of his life. And I think that this is one of the lessons he set out to teach his kids, is to find something that you really love to do. Find a way to have fun in what you do, and find a way to enjoy your life, and the rest of your life will fall into place. And I think I've had a great example in front of me to try and replicate this. I've worked hard to replicate myself in a lot of ways as a professional and as a parent in his, in his, in his vision. Um, but I would have to say that my ability to bullshit is far less impressive. <laughs> Not many first class seats coming. <laughs> um, and for anyone who's wondering, I did actually pass my dissertation defense. <laughs> And when I came out of the room, you know, a little bit relieved, my husband saw me and he looked at me and goes, I'm so sorry. He said, I had no idea how difficult it was for you to achieve anything growing up with a dad like that. And I stopped and I said, you know what? I didn't realize how difficult it was until right now. He said, you got right to the finish line. And then he puts this speed bump right in your way. But really, I think that the thing with my dad is he's always asking people to be better to work smarter and to strive for more, and that's what makes him such a great teacher. He expects greatness from everyone, and that can be a hard buy to reach. But I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have been standing up defending my dissertation if he hadn't put many other challenges in front of me along the way so that I was prepared for that moment in time. And so while he may not be in the classroom any longer, I know we can expect him to continue to challenge all of us to be better, to work harder, and to strive for greatness. And I know in his retirement, he'll keep moving, and he'll always find something that he loves and a way to have fun doing it. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the guest of honor, hot dog lover, <laughs> bullshit extraordinaire, <laughs> my dad, Victor Kemp. salary I get, I can't afford a parking pass. <laughs> <laughs> and every day when I walk to work, I, I, I give this little talk, my retirement talk. As I crutch through the snow, I thank you very much, I'm very honored, and I keep doing this, it's about a 12-minute walk. I never finish it, and I don't know quite what to say, but they'll be the next day, so I can practice again. And uh, it never worked. So uh, last night, uh, I was privileged to have dinner with two former students of mine who drove here to attend this gathering. One is Tom Templin, who was a student here years ago, and we just hired him as our associate dean after uh, after spending 30 some years at Purdue uh, University. And one of my former students, uh, uh, Howie Falasnik, who uh, was my first master's student here. Uh, uh, his, his professor left and he decided to stay here to finish his master's and I had no idea what he was doing. Uh, I couldn't understand anything. I said, just finish it, I'll help you with the writing. And uh, Howard is now an associate dean at, at Purdue University with a very successful career. So after dinner uh, and a couple of glasses of wine, uh, I sat down to write 
uh, about this. Uh, and as I was doing it, my son Jesse, uh, who's one of the most intuitive and insightful 19-year-old persons I've ever met, said to me, Dad, for 45 years you've been giving <laughs> lectures and presentations. Tomorrow you need to tell me and the rest of the folks how you feel and what you've learned. It should be about you, not the data. <laughs> uh, so that was hard for me to think about that, uh, but it's, it was true. So I, I want to say thank you to a few people, uh, not as a real thank you, but as a, what I've learned. I've had a lot of teachers throughout the years, uh, many teachers that have been very impactful to me, uh, and I want to <coughs> say a little bit about them, and a little bit about what I've learned. So first I want to thank my ex-wife, Judith Corcoran Hummel, who taught me how to be, or try to be, uh, how important grace and respect are. I want to thank my wife, Heather, who has taught me the importance of giving of yourself to all living beings with a lot of joy and understanding and to accept it is what it is, deal. <laughs> Daughter number one, Erica uh, Benke, has taught me about patience and acceptance, two virtues I have to work every day, all the time. Daughter number two, Leslie, the bullshitter, <laughs> uh, Leslie uh, Dobos, uh, has taught me about the joy that comes from persistent enthusiasm for everything you do. My son Jesse has taught me there are many paths to wisdom and compassion and to be open to all possibilities. Uh, my brother Frank, who's a retired professor at, uh, who was at uh, UMass, and he lives in uh, Santa Barbara now, taught me uh, how important it is to always finish what you start, no matter how hard or easy it may be. Uh, my twin sister, we didn't do, don't know that I have a twin sister, but my twin sister Judy has taught me that you only have one sister, and it's not good to be estranged. Uh, Don Fleming, my first basketball coach when I was a little guy, he's still alive, he's in, uh, in his late 90s now. Uh, he said to me when I was 13 or 14, and quite an accomplished little basketball player, he said, hey Vic, what are you going to do if you don't grow? <laughs> and you're not going to make it in the NBA. Listen to me, kid. I suggest you get an education and do something you're really passionate about. Uh, Franklin Henry, my mentor at uh, Cal, some people have mentioned him. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, that he permitted me to work with him. Uh, for five straight years, uh, we were together six days a week, or actually seven days a week, except Christmas and his wife's birthday, from around 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And uh, he taught me a lot about research. But he had a big vision about what, uh, at that time, physical education could be in the future. And we had a lot of interesting discussions amongst all of the graduate students and faculty, distinguished faculty of Cal, about physical education being an academic discipline, and that it should at one time take its rightly place among the other sciences. At the time, we were uh, a professional program around the country. There were a few programs that were starting uh, to uh, become more, more academic. And uh, he was convinced that this vision of uh, physical education as an academic discipline that has now morphed into the term kinesiology uh, was just a matter of time. He taught me a Aside from all of those conversations, he taught me uh, three very important things. One is words have meaning. Use them very carefully. Excellence is always in the details. 
pay attention. And he said, you know, it will turn out that exercise and nutrition are more important than drugs. Now, damn it, go out and prove it. Paul Hunsaker, who was mentioned here, was uh, the chair and dean, and he's uh, the one who hired me. Actually, I was the second choice uh, of the faculty here. It was for teaching physical education. And, uh, Paul wanted me to come here and uh, sort of establish the uh, laboratory, exercise physiology laboratory. So the, he offered the first person, the first choice, $10,500 to come here. And at the time, I was teaching at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which had closed its doors, and I had to find a job. Uh, and this one opened up right at the same time. And so he offered that fellow $10,500, and then he called me and he said, well, I'd come here for $10,600. I thought, what a deal. Uh, so I accepted the position, and I uh, hold him very dear. Uh, uh, Dean Zernicke mentioned about uh, when I was a coach, and he, uh, actually, uh, what happened is I was with uh, Don Cannon in his office with uh, Paul, and uh, Don said, you did an okay job, your record's not good, but you're pretty good. Uh, I'll offer you a three-year extension and I'll double your salary. Well, I was making $300 to coach, <laughs> including my 10600 We were doing great. Uh, and I said, well, that's pretty nice. And Paul said, that's a great offer. Uh, you, you might want to think about taking that offer. I didn't know at the time, but um, uh, 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 another faculty member who's, uh, whose wife is here, a dear friend of mine, uh, Janine Galetti. So Steve Galetti was at the door listening to this conversation about this. And he was talking to me about how I should talk to Dr. Cameron. And I, uh, uh, Paul said, uh, that's a good idea. You have 30 seconds to make your decision whether you're going to be an academic or a, or a coach. And I said, Wait, stop, we can work this out. It's not bad. And Don Cannon said, I'll give you 10 times your salary, coaching. Whoa, Paul said, five seconds. <laughs> and, and right at that point, I said, academic, Don Cannon, some of you don't, a few that may remember, Don Cannon stood up, took a took a book 